Zazzy TV. Martin Zender here, heralding the Word of God in horizontal stripes. This is one of those things that I don't recommend you try at home. Uh, not only heralding the Word of God, but heralding it accurately. Again, I'm a trained professional. I don't recommend heralding the God with heralding the Word of God with any kind of stripes, let alone horizontal stripes. If you must do it, use vertical stripes. Uh, but horizontal stripes, this is a huge career risk, and yet I need to, you know, challenge myself every once in a while and shake it up. That's what I am doing this morning. God is such an understater. There are so many epic things that he does that he simply states and then moves on. You know, in fact, God isn't the only one who does this, come to think of it. I mean, I think any great writer or anyone who aspires to be a great writer tries to understate. This is probably a complimentary message to my message in which I shared with you my disdain of exclamation points and emojis and things like that. Uh, I am not a big fan of the overwrought sentence or the overwrought emotions. In fact, Mark Twain said, if you want to produce uh, good writing, uh, go ahead and write what you need to and then go back and strike all the adjectives. Yes, Mark Twain believed in writing with verbs and nouns. The dog ran. Leave the qualifiers out. The furry dog ran quickly. Now that kind of bleeds the life out of it. It demuscularizes it, according to many. Mark Twain certainly thought so. I try to avoid them when I can. But God avoids them most of all. A. E. Nock was the, the opposite, really. Oh, no, A. E. Nock did this too, actually. A. E. Nock would say something that I thought was so great, and then he would just move on to the next topic. And I thought, man, I could take that one thought and expound on it for days, or expound on it in an entire book. And I actually did that when I learned from A. E. Nock that it wasn't the rib that God had removed from Adam to create Eve. It was a hollow chamber, or in the concordant version of the Old Testament, an angular vault. And so when I learned that God removed the womb from Adam, when I learned that Adam was a complete human being, and that Eve was actually inherent in him, and that his feminine parts and his feminine characteristics as well were taken away from him. To me, this was mind-boggling. It solved so many social mysteries and gender mysteries concerning, of course, men and women that I ended up writing like three or four books, some of them yet to be published. But I'll get to them when I move over to the cottage. So, A. E. Nock was guilty 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 of what God has done of what God has done and probably Mark Twain did it too and I strain to do it that is to be understated understated but here in the scriptures I'm gonna bring forth to you right now two of the most egregious but wonderful understatements that God has ever made and the first one is Genesis 1.16. Why am I doing this? That's a good question. I, I might have to think about this. I might have to put on vertical stripes to think about this. Why am I doing this? Oh, I just realized why I'm doing this. I really didn't know when I started this show. I did not know why I was doing this. I just thought, oh, that's interesting. Here's a couple, couple uh, laid-back statements of God that have monumental consequences. And I just thought it was interesting. And I hadn't really thought why I was doing this until now. Why? 
we want God to lay out for us in beautiful, expressive language, including a cornucopia of adjectives, many qualifiers. We want him to write paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs about our expectation, about our celestial realm. Oh, if any of you read my newsletter this past weekend, ZWTF, about our celestial allotment, it is about what does it go to it. It's uh, volume 8, issue 20. The name of it is, is something about the celestial realms. What does it look like? What do the celestial realms consist of? Again, we have no giant expositions about this from God, so we have to look at clues that the Scripture provides us, and we have to put different things together from different places in Scripture. This is what I did in volume 8, number 20 of the ZWTF this past weekend, because you have to, because God is so scant. God just kind of touches things. He hops, skips, and jumps. He goes, and this, and this, and then this happened, and then we do this, and then we do this, and then we do this, and he's, you want to go, stop, stop. Elaborate, please. Like A. Enoch says one thing. Oh, by the way, Adam was had male and female parts, and God didn't take a rib. He took the womb. On to the next paragraph. What? On to the next paragraph? I can make a career out of that statement. And I have made a partial career out of it. So we want God to be more expressive, uh, should I say, well, not more expressive, we want him to be more descriptive, but he's not, and so we have to take these elements. But this tells us, because God seems to do this all the time, so this is actually good news, the more you think about it, this is what I mean, because when I show you these two exaggerate, these two understatements, oh, I wish they were exaggerations, when, when you see these two understatements, you will realize that because these short statements are so freighted with glory and so freighted with divine ability, we can then look at other passage of scriptures that God doesn't say really much about. For instance, our snatching away or the fact that we are seated among the celestials in Christ. And you can know with assurance that there is so much more behind it. Behind that statement is so much depth. And when you understand that this is God's modus operandi, that if he gave every detail, my God, the Bible would be, you know, 817 volumes of 4,000 pages each, then it, it will really comfort you. It's like you, when you read something like God's the Savior of all humanity, and then on to the next sentence, on to the next sentence, God is the Savior of all humanity, that is so great. But when I show you these other understatements and what's behind them, you will look at that one and you will realize that that is just the barest glimpse. It's true. It's a fact as it stands, as are these other understatements. But behind it, there has to be so much reality, so much depth, so many details that God just is not going to tell us for now. Not going to tell us. Going to just hold it out to you. And this is another way God... Um, creates a vacuum that he can fill with faith. He can fill with faith. He wants to fill us with faith. He loves faith. He loves to be believed. And this is a challenge to belief when somebody can say, somebody, I call God somebody sometimes, apparently, God can say something like this in Genesis 1.16. Follow me here. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. That's it, right there. He also made the stars. On to the next sentence. He also made the stars. What is the next sentence? Genesis 1, 17. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a child's story, doesn't it? Next verse. To govern the day and the night, to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. There it is. He made the stars, set them in the vault of heaven, and he said, hmm, that's pretty good. On to the next creation. He created the stars also. You've heard me say that if I had created the stars, I would write a five-volume set called How I Created the Stars by Martin Zender. 
Yes. Of course, it would be a great accomplishment, and I probably would never tire of telling you how great it is. That, that's not true. I'm not giving myself enough credit. I don't sit around talking about all my wonderful accomplishments. I just don't. That makes me happy. It makes me think that something of the Spirit of God lives in me. Think about this, because I'm pretty sure this applies to you too. Here we are. We know that we're to become the aristocracy of heaven. We know that the next big thing on God's calendar is our snatching away, our being made immortal. Are these not the greatest things ever? Is this not unspeakable glory that is on tap for us, on schedule for us? And yet, do we go around talking about it? Do we go to the grocery store and talk to the person next to us looking at the bread? Hey, guess what? You never believe. You're never going to believe what I am coming into. You're never, you're never going to believe this, but I'm going to be ruling over you someday. I'm going to be judging you someday because I'm assuming you're not a member of the body of Christ. I am, and ho-ho. No, we don't do that. I wonder why Joseph did it. Joseph told his brothers, I had a dream that all you were going to worship me. What do you think of that? They didn't think much of it. So I think that it's the Spirit of God that gives us the nature of God. I mean, really, it does. It inches us toward the nature of God in that we live ourselves, understated lives. So now that I think about it, if I had created the stars... I would probably simply write an essay about it. I wouldn't restrict it to one sentence like God did. I created, he created the stars also. I'm not quite that godlike. I would have to at least write an essay. It would probably be a, yeah, it would be a 2,000 word essay. I probably could not restrain myself. I would want you to know all the details. I want you to know what I was thinking right before I created the stars, my sense of satisfaction after I created the stars. Well, I guess God did tell us his sense of satisfaction. Yeah, sure he did. He said, and it was good. And it was good. Four words. That's Hemingway-like. Hemingway used to say things like, it was hot. A great Hemingway sentence. God is the Hemingway of Revelation. The Hemingway of Revelation. That would make a good title. I don't think I'll use it. It's a little too abstract. So just think of what's behind this. He made the stars also. It's nearly incredible. Likewise, everything God says concerning us, that he seats us among the celestials, that we complete Christ, who completes the universe. One statement in Ephesians uh, it's either chapter 1 or chapter 3. Read the first three chapters of Ephesians. You will read so many brief statements. Yes, do this in Ephesians. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3. I want you to look at the brief statements that God says through Paul about us. And I want you to consider it in light of what I just read about God creating the stars. He created the stars also. Think of all the stars. Stars innumerable, and they're all known by him. They all have names that are known by him, not the names that we have given them. Beetlejuice? Please, God would never name a star Beetlejuice, and he didn't. That's not the name that God has for it. We will find out the name God has for it. So when you read these things in Ephesians, um, according as he chooses us in him before the disruption of the world, wow. God could write a six by a ten a twelve a fifteen volume set of books on that statement alone of how he chose us in him. How did he do it? What are the details? What are the wrinkles? What are the depths? What are the colors? What are the lights? What did it look like when God did that? What was he thinking? How did he feel afterwards? We don't read of that. Or when Jesus Christ came down to earth. What was he thinking right before he became a mass of duplicating cells on the walls of a teenage girl's uterus? What was he thinking right before that happened? Now you see him, now you don't. When did he first realize he was God's son? These are things we would love to know. These are things we will know, but these are the 
depths of things behind these briefest of statements. Reminds me of something else Hemingway said. Speaking of Hemingway, I read something uh, by him concerning his writing of The Old Man and the Sea. Very short book, but his greatest book. I think he won the Pulitzer for that book, that novel. It's a really a novelette, a novella. But Hemingway said, I went to the sea. I fished. It was hot. This is his description of the book. You won't find these sentences in the book. And he said, and I learned how the water looked when the sun hit it. I learned how the sun reflected off the skin of the fish when it came into the boat. I learned what the boat felt like when the fish, when the fish floundered on the deck. I learned, I learned the smell of the sea, and all these great details. But then he said, and I didn't put any of this into the book. Yes, he goes into this great detail about everything, all these details, everything he noticed, he noticed, but he said, and I didn't write about that. His point was that all of these details informed what he did write. In other words, he could write a sentence, the fish was strong, and behind that is everything he had come to learn by experience about the fish. He knew what was behind that sentence. And somehow, when you read it in context, you know that Hemingway knows what is behind that briefest sentence about the fish. If Hemingway can do it, certainly God can do it. There's so much more behind all these things, and we need to assume that that's true. It has to be true. God is God. i got to get to the second incredible understatement here as my time wanes. That would be Revelation 16, 19. I'm going to read it from the concordant version, and then I will read it from, I don't know why, the new inconsistent version. Revelation 16, 19. Let's start with verse 17. And the seventh messenger pours out his bowl on the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of God, saying, It has occurred. And lightnings and voices and thunders occurred, and a great earthquake occurred, such as did not occur since mankind came to be on the earth. Of such proportions was the quake, and so great. And the great city came to be divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fall. That's the verse I want to emphasize, the sentence. And the cities of the nations fall. Just like that one statement. Do you know? Do you realize what that entails? And the cities of the nations fall. Let me tell you what that entails because the new inconsistent version actually has a nice way of fleshing this out. The great city split into three parts. This would be Jerusalem. And the cities of the nations collapsed. The cities of the nations collapsed. Every city of every nation, think of it. Tokyo, New York, Shanghai, Sao Paulo, Los Angeles, Chicago, Sydney, Paris, London, Bangkok. Oh my, every city, great city. It doesn't even say great city. It just says the cities of the nations fall. And as the NIV says, They collapsed. You remember what happened to the World Trade Center? Of course you do. The two towers, the twin towers on September 11, 2001, they collapsed. It was horrific. It was a nightmare as we looked on through the television camera eye and saw that. Imagine that happening to every building in New York City. Don't, 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 because the horror cannot be imagined. Now imagine it. Okay, go ahead happening to every building of every city. I thought of this when I was, lived in Sao Paulo, Brazil, for a year. I looked at all the buildings there. They're amazing. The buildings of Sao Paulo just go on and on and on. It's not like a regular city where you have this one brief uh, hunk of real estate where the skyscrapers uh, scrape the sky. No, but it's like somebody took 10,000 skyscrapers and just threw them across the landscape. That's Sao Paulo. And I thought, what? oh my God, I just saw everybody going about their day, doing their thing, and thinking that every single building in the city will be destroyed, will 
be shattered, will tumble, will come down like the twin towers of the World Trade Center. Unbelievable. Chaos. Unbelie it, 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 chaos doesn't even begin to cover it. And yet God, with one sentence, says, and, and the cities of the nations fall. And he goes on to the next sentence. Just incredible. Understatement. But behind it is the wrath, and this is the righteous wrath of God, that humanity has built these great structures and laid these great cities like they did the Tower of Babel to become great in the earth themselves. And God has let this go on for 6,000 years. I know ultimately he inspires it, but relatively he lets it go on for 6,000 years for humanity to show what it can do apart from God, the pride, the pride of humanity. God says there's a generation that will, that will account, that will be paid for all the blood of the prophets. And that's the generation that will be alive during the last days of this millennium of this eon. The blood of all the prophets will come to call. And um, the blood and the, the, the pride of all humanity, of all civilizations will come upon the buildings that we know, the buildings that we have seen. I've seen these buildings of Sao Paulo and New York and L.A. and Chicago. I've seen these in Shanghai. I've been there. I've seen them with my own eyes. And to think of them crumbling, to think of them collapsing like the World Trade Center is unbelievable. Yet this, this is the depth of God's hatred of human pride. And again, he levels human pride in order to now prepare it for his saving message to prepare the hearts of the proud. They must be knocked down, knocked down, knocked down in order to finally have fallow, good soil to plant the seeds of truth in them. This is our God. This is our God. This is how we're becoming very understated, very calm, very assured, assured. Yes, we have assurance, but we just don't talk about it, do we? That's okay. It's okay. Don't worry about it. You're becoming godlike. You're becoming godlike. Nobody wants us to elaborate on what we believe, on what we know, on where we're going, because nobody cares about what we think. And so, with calm faces, with a, with a quiet assurance, we go about our business. We may utter a sentence here or there. Maybe we feel guilty that we don't say more than we should. But take the example of God. Short, concise sentences contain great depths of truth.